Hey everybody, welcome to our webinar for this month. My name is Hugh Daigle. I'm a member of CSEE and I'm an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering at UT. For those of you who are not familiar with CSEE, we are a research center uh, comprised of 27 uh, researchers in mainly in uh, petroleum engineering, uh, but we have some uh, folks from outside as well. We have a diverse range of different uh, research topics that we work on. Uh, Professor Matt Balhoff over here is our director and we're very grateful for all the efforts he uh, performs for the center. Uh, we have a variety of different um, applications and disciplines and engineering tools that we work on, including you know, conventional oil and gas, but also unconventional carbon capture utilization and storage, geothermal gas hydrates, uh, we use a number of different tools to investigate these things from computational large-scale experiments and small-scale experiments. And the disciplines uh, span everything from reservoir engineering to geochemistry to geology and other things. Um, we have a number of industrial affiliate programs uh, that are listed here. Uh, these can be found on the CSEE website. And if you have any questions about these, I encourage you to get in touch with the contacts um, that we have listed there on the website. We have a broad range of topics where we help work with industry to focus on problems uh, for the current and future uh, energy industry. So our monthly webinars are uh, intended to be industry-driven webinars on topics of interest to industry from researchers and collaborators within the center. Um, we host them on the second Tuesday of each month in noon central time on Microsoft Teams. Uh, we'll upload the recorded webinars then to our YouTube channel within a few days. So if you miss the webinar, feel free to go back and visit it. We get a lot of views of our, our posted webinars on our YouTube channel. Um, we have an upcoming webinar on March 14th. Uh, Leo Ruiz is going to tell us about a new approach to apply decline curve analysis. Um, but without, uh, and we're not quite sure what will happen uh, for the one in April, but we'll announce that probably next month. Um, if you have questions in the, uh, that you want to ask, please post them in the Q&A section. Um, and we will go through those questions at the end of the presentation, as many as we can. So feel free to type in there as the presentation goes along. We'll um, make sure to get to those at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this month's webinar is uh, Dr. Upali Wirasuria, who is a senior scientist advisor with the center. And he's gonna tell us about ultra short to no formal hydrophobe based surface active solvents and surfactants for chemical EOR. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Upali for the webinar. A warm welcome to uh, all of you. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Today I'll be talking about ultra short to no formal hydrophobe based uh, surface active solvents and surfactants for chemical EOR. And as part of that, uh, this presentation to demonstrate the efficacy of uh, this approach, I'll be showing uh, five uh, sections uh, done by uh, various researchers in the last uh, four or five years. So with that, uh, let me go through a quick introduction. The surfactant structure can be represented by a hydrophobe and uh, the block of EO, block of EO, and uh, uh, hydroxy group or ionic group. Okay, the hydrophobe uh, I am referring to as hard hydrophobe, whereas the block of EO is referred to as the soft hydrophobe, and block of EO refers to as the soft hydrophile, and the ionic group uh, is referred to as the hard hydrophile, and the performance of this. Uh, for different segments is shown here. The hard hydrophobe is very compatible with oil. Soft hydrophobe is more compatible with oil than water. Soft hydrophile is uh, more compatible with water than oil. And uh, the hard hydrophile is uh, very compatible with water. In the past, we have shown surfactants having a variety of hydrophobe sizes. And uh, we started with large hydrophobe, uh, anywhere from uh, 32 carbons to uh, C20A. And then we went down to uh, medium hydrophobe, uh, around uh, 18 carbons. And then went down to short hydrophobe, uh, around 13 carbons, the so-called uh, tridecyl alcohol uh, uh, 
derived surfactants. And we did a very brief foray into ultra-short hydrocarbon with the C8 and with the short PO block. Uh, continuing the introduction, in the beginning, uh, what we had was something like the sodium lauryl sulfate, a C12 with a sulfate group, and also uh, sodium laureate, that's C11 with a carboxylate group. So here, the hydrophobe is here, and the hydrophile is here. And then we started introducing uh, PO groups in between the hydrophobe and the hydrophile, as in this case. And uh, we refer to the block of PO as hydrophobe extension. And in the case of uh, incorporation of EO in between the hydrophobe and the hydrophile, we call the EO block as hydrophile extension. And then we combine both PO and EO blocks into the molecule, and we have something like this uh, alkyl group, PO block, EO block, and an anionic group. Uh, such as sulfate or carboxylate or cationic group if needed. If no ionic group is there, then it's a free hydroxyl group. So uh, our foray into the ultra-short hydrophobe uh, uh, can be shown by this molecule, which is uh, starting with uh, methanol, one carbon hydrocarbon, uh, and then a block of PO, block of PO, and an anionic group if it's there. So in this case, since we are dealing with basically no hydrophobe here, then the PO block uh, behaves like a hydrophobe. And the EO block is still a hydrophile extension because we have this anionic group. If we don't have the anionic group, if this is a totally non-ionic molecule, then the EO block will be the hydrophile. Okay. So as in, as in this case, uh, with the hydrophobe, with the hydrophile extension, as long as you have an ionic group attached to it. If no ionic group, then that's the hydrophobe and this is the hydrophile. So the very early uh, examples uh, we have uh, studied uh, are based on uh, methanol as the starting material. So methanol with uh, PoEO, uh, optionally sulfate or carboxylate, otherwise it's a non-ionic. Similarly, phenol-based molecule like so, and 2 ethyl hexanol, that's C8, uh, something like this, branch uh, hydrophobe, short hydrophobe, and, and like this. Now, we have, uh, you know, arrived at a sort of uh, unconventional uh, uh, definition for surfactant versus solvents. If the block of PO is greater than 10 moles, then we refer to it as surfactant, and uh, if it is less than 10 PO, then we refer to it as uh, solvent or surface active solvents. Okay, so that's an arbitrary number we just picked. The more PO you have in the molecule, the more it gets toward the surfactant side. So here's one of the early examples of uh, utilizing ultra short hydrophobe uh, surfactant. Uh, in conjunction with an alkyl benzene sulfonate by uh, Baker Hughes. And it's really interesting because uh, this is a light oil, and this oil is sandstone, the temperature is very high, 90 degrees C, and the injection water is seawater. So under these conditions, they figured out uh, the combination of the two EH, 40 PO, 40 EO, non ionic, right? Here, yeah, that's the here, that's addition to the hydrophobe. This is the hydrophobic uh, component, and this is the hydrophile. Right? It's a non ionic. And then, uh, in conjunction with the alkyl benzene sulfonate, uh, they were able to get ultra low IFT regime. And then they try to optimize the ratio between the two components, the non ionic and the uh, anionic, in this uh, in this plot. And as you can see, depending on how much surfactants you use, uh, you get a broader uh, uh, ultra low IFP region. And if you use very low level of surfactants, 0.1, then you still get ultra low IFP, but not as broad as the 0.3. Now, in 0.1 percent case, the, the ABS sulfonate is going to be like 0.03, and uh, the 
non nilic after short type of form, non nilic surfactant is going to be 0 0.07. So that's a very good uh, starting point to uh, demonstrate the efficacy of uh, this class of uh, molecules. So next, uh, we'll go to a presentation uh, done by Quan Bike. Uh, and uh, he uh, demonstrated uh, improved polymer flooding using surface active solvents for heavy oil recovery. Now, when we talk about heavy oil, uh, obviously heavy oil contains uh, uh, a lot of naphthenic uh, acid uh, components. So it's a surface active solvent acting in conjunction with the uh, naphthenic component that gives the low IFT behavior. And the two classes of uh, surface active solvents he studied, uh, one was based on phenol, it's a block of PEO and block of PEO. The other one was based on 2 ethylhexanol, like so, it's a block of PEO and block of PEO. And the uh, first thing he did was measure the IFT, uh, with a heavy oil using spinning potentiometer. Uh, temperature was 61 and uh, he used a variety of uh, salinic ranges and the surface active solvents he picked were 2EH based with uh, 4 PEO and 7 PEO with varying amounts of PEO and the phenol based with 4 PEO and 7 PEO, 7 PEO with varying amounts of PEO. So, and he found that uh, the lowest IFT was given by the 2 VH with 7 PO and 15 EO. So on the 2 VH side and uh, on the phenol side, again phenol 7 PO 15 EO gave the lowest IFT for that class of molecules, although the phenol 7 PO 15 EO IFT is uh, much higher than what uh, he obtained for 2 VH 7 PO 15 EO. And the next task was to figure out uh, the critical micelle concentration of this uh, selected molecule, 2EH7P or 15EO, operating in conjunction with the naphthenic acid. Okay? Uh, it turns out that uh, the critical micelle concentration also came out to be 0 0.025 here, weight percent. So, so those, so the, those of you who are not familiar with critical micelle concentration, the CMC uh, determines uh, whether the, the chemicals are as individual molecules or they are organized into uh, micelles. So anything at or above the critical micelle concentration will give surfactant or surfactancy. So with that information, uh, he uh, proceeded on to do uh, sand pack flooding. It's a secondary, and I won't go through this table, but uh, we'll talk about the results in a minute. Here the experimental setup, which uh, many of us are very familiar with. And uh, the results of the flooding are shown here. The blue line shows the polymer flooding, which we can call a control experiment. And then the next two uh, uh, curves show almost identical curves uh, have the same PV times C. In the first case, uh, it has 0.1% surfactant with 0.5 volumes. In the second case, it has 0.5% surfactant and 0.1% uh, uh, so, PV times C is the same in both cases and, and turns out to be very similar in behavior. And the red line is where he went for larger power volume with the larger surfactant concentration, 0.5% surfactant with 0.5 power volume and he got uh, over 90% oil recovery. So, just to summarize uh, this part, the surface active solvent with the lowest IFT was selected as the optimum surfactants, in which case uh, 2 EH, 7 PO, 15 EO. Now again, uh, I'd like to remind you that this works in conjunction with the hydrophobic naphthenic acid that's present in the 
heavy oil or viscous oil. So IFP reduced as salinity increased as expected. And for each SAA, the lowest IFP was found near its aqueous stability limit, and that's also uh, expected. Uh, low IFP resulted in faster phase separation after mixing. The improved polymer flooding achieved incremental oil recovery by increased capillary number with IFP reduction. The IFP reduction is shown here from 15.8 dimes per centimeter to 0.025 dimes per centimeter and the corresponding capital numbers are in the to start with in the 10 to the minus 5 range and ended up with 10 to the minus 2 range. And we've got delayed polymer breakthrough and uh, when you compare the polymer compared to the polymer flooding, the improved polymer flooding resulted in the uh, experiment 1 and 2 up to about 16 percent incremental oil recovery in uh, experiment number three, uh, we covered about extra 27% incremental oil recovery. Now let's move on to uh, surface active solvent, surfactant partitioning in viscous oil. This work uh, was done by Krishna and others, and uh, i go through it uh, pretty quick. Now, background surfactants play an important role in EUR by mobilizing trapped oil. Surfactants can partition in both water and oil systems. Higher the surfactant partitioning into oil, the less the oil recovery. And that's an important point. Non ionic surfactants partition more to the oil compared to ionic surfactants, and that's also as expected. And uh, this. Uh, Surfactant partition study helps to calculate the surfactant retention in core clouds. So here the properties are given here. The oil properties, very viscous soil, 70 degrees C, and it's a highly, very active oil. So acid number is like 4.5 milligrams of KOH per gram. And here the Sera analysis, uh, as you can see, saturates, aromatic, resins, and asphaltines. And the brine composition uh, is hardness ions present here. And the examples he, uh, he studied are shown here. We now 20p or 50 or Now this is this falls into the uh, surfactant category with ultra short hydrophobe and the rest of the material fall into the surface active solvent category. Uh, Pheno 7 PEO, 15 EO, Pheno 4 PEO, 15 EO, Pheno 4 PEO, 10 EO. All these gave good uh, phase behavior results with low IFT. When you drop down from 4 PEO to 3 PEO or 2 PEO, then the phase behavior was not good. And as a control uh, or comparison, he used uh, the C9118, you did the near doll uh, 911 with 8 mols of you, and that also gave good phase behavior with low IFT. So, so his uh, target was to uh, measure the surfactant partitioning between oil and water, and here he describes uh, how to do that measurement. First thing you do is you pick a uh, equal amounts of oil and water with the surface active material and mix it really well for a couple of days and then isolate the aqueous solution and figure out how much uh, uh, surface active material is left in the aqueous phase. And uh, for the control, you do the same experiment without oil. So what's, uh, what has disappeared must have gone to the oil phase. And then you can calculate the partition coefficient, K, which is the concentration in the oil phase divided by the concentration in the water phase. So yes, uh, some phase behavior tubes. The first one is the, uh, the surfactant version of the outer short hydrophobe that gives very good uh, results. Phase behavior after low IFT. And then uh, phenol 7P or 15 EO and uh, phenol 4P or 15 EO both appeared very similar to the phenol 20P or 50 EO in terms of uh, phase behavior. 
and the IFT turned out to be 0 0.0035 dimes per centimeter, which falls closer to the ultra low IFT regime. And uh, when you compare this with the control, control also behaves similarly, very good uh, phase behavior, ultra low IFT, and, uh, and wide range of uh, salinities. And uh, here in the conclusion, uh, uh, the surface active solvent, surfactant partition, was studied for three different uh, non ionic uh, active species phenol 7 PO, 15 EO, phenol 4 PO, 10 EO, and uh, near the all 9, 11, 8 EO. Uh, in the, the phenol PO EO case, only about 40% of the surfactant, uh, surface active material partition into the oil phase, whereas in the near all case, uh, about 60% uh, of the surface active material partition into the oil phase. And uh, this could be a small drawback here, but uh, the main thing here is that the novel uh, ultra short hydrophobe POE or non ionics uh, can give uh, good phase behavior in conjunction with uh, an actinic acid uh, present in the heavy oil. And the third uh, segment is uh, wettability alteration and water flooding in carbonate reserve oils using phenol 4PO XEO. The phenol 4PO was uh, as a result of what Krishna did uh, in his study previously. So she said that uh, phenol 4PO and varied the amount of EO in the molecule. So this was uh, done by Chami Miller, who has left beauty for greener pastures. And uh, here the objective is to enhance oil recovery from tight carbonate reservoirs using novel wettability altering surface active solvents without adding polymer or alkanity. So the challenges, these are the challenges in tight oil, uh, tight carbonate uh, EOR because uh, using polymers uh, tend to create uh, a lot of problems because of the low permeability less than 20 millidacy. And also you have a higher divalent cation concentration in brine and so on. So the structures again uh, is a phenol with a block of PO. It's, in this case it's 4PO. So it's definitely in the surface active uh, solvent uh, regime. And uh, so go on to her experimental results for the description. Uh, the, the whole thing operates under wettability alteration. Now, if you take a carbonate surface and if you have heavy oil, then there is uh, oil wetting on the surface by complexation or attraction of the calcium ions to especially the naphthenic acid present in the oil. Okay, and then if you introduce the surface active molecules into the water, then the surface active molecules can go in and uh, displace the the oil wetting agents uh, away from the hard surface. So that will convert the oil wet surface into partially water wet or fully water wet. And uh, is depicted in this diagram also, oil field, small pores, surfactant aided water invention and water field, small pores. And the uh, phenol 4PEO with uh, varying ranges of EO were tested under different uh, conditions, different temperatures and hardness levels. And uh, all the examples that were picked here were stable uh, under this condition. Stable meaning they had enough aqueous stability to stay clear in the solution. And then uh, she did the contact angle screening and spontaneous inhibition, and that leads to surfactant aided water flooding. So the control is the experimental temperature is 116 degrees C, very high temperature. The control drying is shown here, and the contact angle is 148. Uh, 
when she used the phenol 4 PEO with 60 moles of PEO, the contact angle dropped down to 91. And with phenol 4 PEO 70, PEO, the contact angle dropped down to you know, 65. And then uh, when she went for the lower temperature uh, uh, applications, it turns out that the 20 year molecule, that the phenol 4 PEO with 20 moles of PEO, gave the lowest contact angle, and uh, so that looked uh, really attractive. So the conclusions from this study is that phenol 4 PEO 20 EO changed wettability of low temperature carbonate rocks to preferentially water weight. Phenol 4 PEO 60 EO changed the wettability of high temperature carbonate rock to preferentially intermediate weight. And uh, phenol 4 PEO 70 EO changed wettability of the same rock to preferentially water weight. So at the highest temperature, the Phenol 4 PEO 70 EO was the best, and at the low temperature, is uh, phenol 4 PEO 20 EO. And uh, the, you can change the ratio of the PEO to EO and uh, get whatever the uh, echo stability you want. So now uh, we shift gears and move on to uh, again an extension of this idea of ultra short hydrophobe and no hydrophobe. Uh, this is a good example we have shown previously methanol, phenol, or 2EH, phase PO, EO, uh, non ionics in this case, or anionics. We have a sulfate or a carboxylate group. And then uh, we went to the nitrogen based. Uh, chemistry here. We have an amine here, so nitrogen has three, three valencies, so you can have three lines going in here. So you can add PO first, like so, and then EO next. Or you can mix it up and add EO first or EO second. And since you have a nitrogen here, you can do some additional chemistry here. You can make a sweeter ionic by reacting the amine portion with the uh, something like sodium chloroacetate, or you can make a, a quaternary ammonium compound, like like so, like so. Okay, and then we proceeded to uh, go down to glycerol-based ultra-short hydrophobe polyol alkoxylate, surfactants, and cosolan, shown here. Now again, and now in this case, we are dealing with three uh, lines here, three surfactant lines. So we may want to modify our cutoff point for surfactancy versus solvency uh, accordingly. So I think uh, for these kinds of molecules, as well as the amine-based structures, we can say uh, greater than 30 moles of PO will fall into the surfactant regime, and less than 30 moles of PO will fall into uh, uh, the surface active solvent regime. And if it is at 30 moles of PO, then you are into both sides of the equation. So, so here's an example of now surfactant and cosolvent formulation for unconventional EOR. This is uh, one of the rare uh, occasions where we start talking about EOR, unconventional EOR. So, JIT, Lienage, did uh, this work, and here are the reservoir properties. Dead oil, you know, light, still light oil, temperature reasonably high, 75 degrees, viscosity very low, very high solution, gas ratio, and reservoir pressure very high. Now, the live oil, synthetic live oil, is uh, basically methane and ethane, right? so very, very light oil. and. Uh, <laughs> There are two types of water available. One is the injection water with the lower TDS and lower calcium level. And then there is the connect water, which has very high salinity and very high, much higher calcium magnesium level. So whatever the formulation we pick, it should answer to a mix of both synthetic injection water and high salinity connect water. So if you can't address the mixture, uh, requirement, then you don't have a good formulation. So let's go through uh, his approach. First, uh, he 
came up with the novel formulation one where he used the methanol based uh, gas with 21 moles of PO, so obviously this is a surfactant molecule. And he made the sulfate version of the, he used the sulfate version of this with the uh, standard uh, C1518 internal olefin sulfonate. Good face behavior, but poor aqua stability because you have a lot of calcium magnesium and none of these will get you the calcium magnesium stability. Then uh, it can go over to uh, novel formulation two again using methanol based uh, PO EO sulfate, again ultra short hydrophobic surfactant with C6 diphenyl disulfonate. Diphenyl disulfonates are complex with calcium really well, so it was basically used to get the uh, calcium magnesium tolerance to the surfactant formulation. However, this is more and more like salt that uh, it does not function into the uh, middle phases and so on, so it stays in the water. Plus, it's a rather expensive molecule. So then uh, he changed over to now formulation number three, with high oil and high pressure. So now he's using uh, non-ionic version of the ultra short hydrophobe uh, surfactant with uh, one of our new uh, molecules, glycerine 6PO. So that's a surface active solvent. Get a good face behavior. And for those of you who can't remember the structure of the glycerin 6PO is, that's, that's glycerin molecule backbone. And uh, it's an average of uh, 2 PO each, so it's a total of 6 PO. So definitely it's, uh, it falls into the uh, solvent regime. And then I tested the dilution experiment with 50% dilution of the injection water and high salinity connect water, and again uh, it, it was fine. Uh, and uh, there was no impact on the uh, IFT. So the conclusion uh, for this work is as shown here in our cell factors and cause solvents were studied for unconventional UR formulations. Conventional formulation works well with dead oil, but does not form uh, ultra low IFT with live oil. And the uh, methanol based non ionic uh, uh, surfactant or sulfate gives good face behavior with live oil. And the use of uh, Daufax uh, C6L, that is the C6 diphenyl disulfonate was used to give the calcium solubility but shows no partition into the oil emulsion phase. The cost of disulfonate uh, formulation is higher, therefore alternative lower cost uh, now also the ones were identified and it's a good example of such uh, novel cost of one, inexpensive and abundant based on glycerin. And it was used as a surface active cost of one to give good aqua stability while not increasing the IFT. So now we come to the last segment, uh, the work done by uh, Nadika. And this is uh, glycerol based surfactant for solvents for chemical or application. In this case, it's mainly for uh, active oil. So here are the virtues of glycerol based surfactant for co solvents because glycerol is abundantly available made from triglycerides, it's non-toxic and glycerol finds uses in uh, food, medical and pharmaceutical industry. So the two types of brines used were brine A and brine B. Brine B is the soft version of brine A and uh, active oil, uh, gravity 15.3, very active oil, oil viscosity high, reasonably high and uh, the temperature is 21 degrees C. Now this is very important because the because the customer prefers to have all the chemicals in the liquid form at 21 degrees C. Okay. So here's uh, one formulation, Nadika uh, tried uh, ASP formulation again with naphthenic salts. So it's more like an ACP or SP kind of thing. 
uh, this again 30 PO, 35 EO, uh, uh, non ionic. So 30 PO now is kind of borderline between solvents and surfactants. So is, you can call it ASPO, ACPO, but ABS was used as a surfactant. So this is definitely uh, ASP. And the organic alcohol used was monoethanolamine, and the brine was a mixture of A and B. And here the activity map, as you can see, good uh, ultra low IFT regimes for 10% oil, 30% oil, and 50% oil. However, the slope is steep. So if you are going to do a core flat, then it's not easy to find the uh, common injection salinity that will cover all, uh, all levels of oil. And uh, the slope of the activity map is steeper maybe because of the hydrophilic ABS that was used. So now, uh, the, here the face behavior is you know, good, very good face behavior. 10% oil, 50% oil, and 30% oil and 50% oil. And then uh, she moved over to the, get the glycerin 30P or 50P or non iodine And that's the only surface active material there, other than the naphthenic acid uh, soap that can be produced uh, with the organic alkali. And again, brine A and B were mixed. So the activity map is shown here. Now the, the slope, very good uh, face behavior, ultra good, very good ultra low IFT regime for 10%, 30%, and 50% uh, oil. And the slope is uh, much, uh, much uh, lower. Okay, So this became very attractive, and uh, as a result, uh, they decided to uh, go for a core flood with this formulation. And this gave the parameters for the core flood. And here is the oil recovery curve. We recovered almost all the oil in this formulation. Okay, so that's a very attractive formulation for this particular oil. And, uh, so in summary uh, and conclusion, the new surface active solvent or surface active surfactant class exhibits ultra low IAT phase behavior with heavy oil under alkaline pH. Again, let me remind you that uh, this gets help from the sodium naphthenate salts that gets produced under alkaline conditions. Lower concentration of SAs have been shown to generate low to ultra low IFT. Although in this particular example, we use 0.5% uh, 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 concentration. Uh, it has been tested that lower concentration and we still use a low IFT. Uh, the formulation can be tuned by changing POE or tools to obtain uh, the target optimum salinity. If you want to go for a higher optimum salinity, you can do so with, uh, with a higher EO level. And SAS offers robust ACP ASP design if, if alkali is consumed by some mechanism, then the ASP or ACP, uh, the surface active material is still there, and that will give you the improved polymer flooding. So oil saturation was reduced from 80% to nearly 0% uh, during the core flood, and the core solvent retention was 0.1 milligrams per gram of rock, and that's a very low. Uh, retention number, so this allows uh, using minimal uh, amounts of the core solvent or core surfactant. So with that, uh, I will give you a heads up on uh, another segment that uh, will come pretty soon. Now we introduce all these uh, novel surfactants. The next uh, goal is to make sure that these molecules can be produced commercially to our specifications and that work is ongoing and hopefully at the next GIP meeting uh, we'll be able to present some of that work. So with that, uh, before concluding, uh, let me acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. William H. Wade 
and Gary Paul for keeping the chemical EOR program alive and very robust at the University of Texas over many, many decades. So without uh, this program, uh, first uh, with uh, Bill Wade and, uh, and after that with uh, Gary Pope, uh, we won't be talking like this. I want to convey my deep appreciation to all the researchers who played important roles in all these EOR chemical technology breakthroughs, starting with large to intermediate to short to ultra short to no hydrophobic surfactor and the subsequent surface active solvents. And my also my special thanks go to the industry sponsors who funded this work in the past and those who still continue to do so. So I thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, we can try the Q&A session now. OK, well, thank you, Apali, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we have one question here. Um, there has been some work modifying polymer molecules with surfactants. Do you see this as a promising EOR method? Uh, I have been uh, thinking about this for a while now, and I have also consulted some polymer manufacturers uh, you know, there have been reference to uh, surface active polymers, but uh, very, very uh, tiny amount of surface active material included in the polymer backbone. So uh, right now I don't see any uh, real application of surface active polymers uh, according to the polymer manufacturers. Um, another question here. Do you see surfactants as being effective for unconventional reservoirs? And is the mechanism wettability alteration or something else? It could be both uh, wettability alteration and something else. And I think we are very hopeful that uh, this will pick up in the unconventional. Uh, we have a lot of uh, high hopes in commercializing. Uh, uh, these kinds of molecules, application of these kinds of surface active solvents and uh, surfactants uh, in unconventional because there's a vast potential for that. Well, uh, we are just beginning this uh, new phase. Now, we were the ones who pioneered this large hydrophobe concept, right? With the large uh, Gerbier alcohols and things like that. And then we went down to uh, uh, medium size C18 oil type uh, hydrophobe and went down to C13 and so on. So it became natural, obvious to us that we need to go down even further and get to the ultra short hydrophobe. And when we get got there, we decided, hey, let's try without even a single carbon uh, the alcohol to, to make this molecule. So basically a block of PO and block of EO. Now, if you look at the structure of the, the nitrogen version, you know, let me see whether I can get there. OK, here, uh, all this time we are talking about just uh, straight chain molecules, right? Now, here with the amine, we have three lines going on, OK? And uh, similarly with the glycerol molecule also, we have three lines going on, and that's why I assigned, uh, say, 30 moles, higher than 30 moles of PO for the entire molecule will be the surfactant and less than 30 moles, it will be a cross solvent. Now, if, if we can think back, there are what this class of special surfactants called Gemini surfactants, where we had two surfactant chains joined by a small uh, carbon chain. And those molecules exhibited very low CMCs and uh, very good uh, surface uh, properties. So we may be uh, doing even better with these uh, three lines. You know, Gemini contains only two lines joined uh, together somewhere by a small carbon chain. Now here we have three lines joined together. So we may be looking at even, even better uh, performance uh, improvements. So that's a comment I like to make and also uh, we hope that uh, we can exploit this uh, new technology uh, more and more in the future. Now, the driving force for this uh, ultra short hydrophobe work came with the finding that uh, some short hydrophobe chains were more compatible with the light oil fractions of the of the oil. If you 
take a given oil, there's all kinds of uh, carbon chain length uh, in the oil, right? So very light oil fractions uh, could be very attractive targets for these ultra short uh, hydrofoils, and especially the methanol based or diesel oil based uh, molecules. And the amine version, since we can transform the amine into a cationic, uh, cationics are known to do wettability alteration, or ionics, you know, that can withstand any kind of uh, calcium magnesium levels. Uh, we are going to find uh, additional applications, not only in the chemical EOR, but in uh, other oil field uh, chemical applications. Can you share with us your opinion on natural surfactant? Well, yeah, first natural surfactant is soap. So, <laughs> I know there have been some biotechnology work going on in uh, converting, uh, uh, you know, transforming uh, things like uh, glycerol or some other molecules, lighter molecules into a surfactant type molecules. Uh, there have been uh, examples where people came halfway there by using a natural component like sugar molecule with uh, again uh, synthetic or natural alcohol. So these are called the uh, alkyl polyglucosides uh, and things like that. And uh, so I don't see any uh, large scale application for this so called natural surfactant as of yet, but uh, the field is open. Okay, so uh, well, I just want to thank today's speaker, uh, Opali. Um, thanks for all your knowledge on surfactants. That was an excellent uh, webinar. Uh, we also uh, thank the audience for their time and for asking such great questions, and we invite you next month when uh, Leo is going to talk about new decline curve analysis methods, especially for unconventional reservoirs. So uh, thank you all again and uh, have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.